Hello everyone, um, welcome to this webinar, um, an introduction to the British Social Attitudes Survey. Um, my name is Sarah Kinghill and I work for the UK Data Service in user support and training and I'm based at the University of Manchester. And uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit later on about how you access the BSA. Um, the main speakers, however, who work for NAPSEN are going to be Miranda Phillips, who's the research director working on the BSA, and Eleanor Taylor, who's a researcher for NAPSEN, also working on the BSA. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Miranda, who is going to give our first part of the talk. Hello, everyone. So, thanks for the introduction, Sarah. Okay, so we're going to talk to you today about the British Social Attitudes Survey. Um, we're going to cover a few things around that as well. So this is just to explain everything we're talking about in the webinar, starting off with who NAPSEN is, um, and before we get into the details of the survey, we want to reflect a little bit on why we would want to measure attitudes in the first place. I'll then talk um, briefly through the methodology for British Social Attitudes, and I'll hand over to Eleanor to give an, an example of the kind of analysis that you can use BSA data for. We'll finish off by talking about dissemination of findings and um, some practical tips about carrying, an, carrying out your own analysis using BSA. And then we'll hand back to Sarah, who'll talk through accessing the data from the UKDS. If you've got any questions while we're going through, just type them in as we're talking. We won't handle them until the end, but when we get to the end, we'll try and cover all of them. So NATSEN Social Research, which runs the British Social Attitudes Survey, is uh, the largest independent social research agency in Britain. We're a not-for-profit organisation. We have lots of different clients and funders, but the majority of our work comes from central government clients. We do lots of different types of research, probably the best known are our big surveys, um, but we also do qualitative work, evaluation, secondary analysis, and in lots of different policy areas such as education, welfare, work, and health. If you're interested in finding out more about what we do, our website's a good place to start. It's got lots of information about our reports and our current projects. Okay, so I wanted to start off just reflecting on why we'd want to measure attitudes. There are some people, and it's probably fair to say this used to be the case more than, um, more than it is these days, but some people who feel that attitudinal research isn't legitimate. And these fall roughly into two types of concerns. So the first is that attitudes don't matter. And under this heading, that would en encompass the view that behavior and experience is more important. It's not what people say, but what they do that really matters for policymakers. A related point, attitudes and behavior aren't always consistent, and that's true. Um, so if you know what someone thinks, it won't necessarily tell you what they'll do. And lastly, under this heading, that we don't want government by opinion poll. And this is really a worry that knowing what people think may mean that government just does what the people want, rather than taking tough decisions and leading from the front. So the second group of concerns is really about how you go about measuring attitudes and a feeling that it's very difficult. Um, and it's true that there are challenges associated with attitude measurement. But we'd say the same is true of any survey. And if you think about measuring something that you might call an objective fact, such as um, alcohol consumption, for example, you can see that actually there will be challenges around the wording and the context and the order that the questions are asked in the questionnaire. And it's true that for attitude questions especially, but again, I'd say for all surveys, that how you word your questions will have a crucial impact on how people respond. Um, well, what we'd say is that we want to acknowledge that and then address it by the way that we design the survey. So these are legitimate concerns, um, but it won't surprise you to hear that we would argue that attitudes do matter. Our attitudes and values are an important part of our social world, 
And if we can't measure them reliably and describe them, then we're going to miss out on a big part of the jigsaw. So see it not as an alternative to behavioral and factual surveys, but as a complement to them. And they matter to policymakers too. Policymakers need to be aware of what people think and whether it's changing. We know that attitudes and legislative change can go hand in hand. So for example, we know there have been changing views about same-sex relationships. And that has really led the way for allowing legislation for same-sex marriage. That wouldn't have been conceivable 30 years ago. We also know that policies can fail if they hit attitudinal barriers. It's not just about um, what people know and what they um, care about. It's also what they think and feel. Another argument for measuring attitudes is that if we don't do it, that people will guess and make assumptions about what people think, and they'll often get it wrong. We also know that when that happens, there are competing claims, and that there are dominant voices, uh, politicians, journalists, um, people with access to the media, and it will be their voices that get heard. What we want to do is make sure that the public view is uh, collected and known about. And when it comes to solving the measurement and question design problems, that's something that we address through spending a lot of time and effort crafting our questions, testing them, and refining them so that we have measures that are robust and reliable. So let's turn now to looking at the British Social Attitudes Survey. It's, um, I'm going to talk about an overview and also some methodology. It's one of Britain's most well-known and frequently used surveys, and one reason for that is that it's very highly regarded. It's seen as an independent and authoritative source of information about contemporary British attitudes and how these are changing over time. And the quote on the slide from the FT just really illustrates that. Okay, so this is your at-a-glance um, overview of BSA, and I'll talk about some of this in more detail in what follows. But just to quickly run through it, um, so the British Social Attitudes Survey was uh, initiated by NatSEN, and it began in the early 1980s, and we run the survey annually. And it measures social and political attitudes and moral values. The key aim of the survey is to look at change over time. So many of our questions are repeated so that they build up a time series, but it's also important that we keep the survey up to date, so each year we include new questions that reflect current areas of interest. In terms of methodology, it's an annual cross-sectional survey, so it's important to note it's not a panel. It's a random probability sample, and I'll say more about that later. And we interview roughly 3,000 respondents each year that's adults aged 18 or over, living in Britain, that's England, Scotland, and Wales. We don't cover Northern Ireland, but it's worth just telling you that we've got a sister survey in Scotland. So if you're particularly interested in the policy context there, Scottish Social Attitudes has a much bigger sample for Scotland. The interview itself comes in two parts. There's a CAPI, or face-to-face -face interview, and also a self-completion booklet. And we have a range of different funders for the survey, and these change from year to year. Uh, it includes the big government departments, charities, and also grant-giving bodies. We've got a wide range of users, from government and charities to other social researchers and journalists. And it's also used a lot by academics and students um, I used it in my university course, and, and perhaps some of you did too. So just to give you a flavour of what's in the survey, I want to show you some example topic areas. Um, so first of all, we cover some of the major policy areas, such as health and education and housing. These are typically funded by government. But we also have more... Um, academic topics, if you like, uh, less regularly on the survey, often funded by the grant-giving bodies and research councils, and 
that gives you a flavour of the kind of thing that we might cover under that heading. Some of these topics are on the survey most years, others are more occasional. The important thing to note is that when you're trying to understand what BSA is about, the topics change from year to year and it all relates to who's funded it and what they're interested in. So you always need to do some scoping out to work out which questions are on each year. Okay, so we're just going to have a poll um, to ask you how long you think it takes to do the fieldwork for BSA. And just to remind you, it's face-to-face -face and we get about 3,000 interviews. So the answer options you can see in front of you, one month, two months, four months, eight months. Okay, thank you. So uh, we've got an equal split on the winning answers, which are that 38% of you think four months, 38% of you think eight months, and the rest are saying um, shorter durations. The answer is four months, um, which is quite a long time in um, social research uh, timescales, but it's important for the way we collect the data, and I'll say a bit more on that later. So thank you for taking part. Um, I'll show you what the survey timeline looks like. Um, around the start of the year, we're finalising our funding, and then we start with question design and sampling. We continue question design and pilot our new questions, and then we program the final questionnaire. And then here's that four-month period for field work, so between about June and September, we're in the field. And then after we've collected the data, there's a process of editing and derived variable creation before we deliver data in December. And then we spend um, at least half, probably, of the year following the survey doing analysis and reporting and, and various different types of dissemination. We're currently um, talking to potential funders for the 2017 survey and beyond, so if any of you are on the commissioning side of research or if you've got an idea for a grant-funded project that would be a good fit for BSA, please do get in touch with us. We're very open to new funders and collaborators on the survey. So I mentioned that the first thing we do really in the design in the whole process of the survey is question design. And this is for any new questions. Um, we also run repeat questions each year to continue our time series. And the process that we go through is longer and more detailed than you'd find on most other surveys. So we have an initial stage where we're talking to the client, um, working out what we need the question to do, what the objective is and have a number of design meetings. Once we've got some draft questions that have been revised and refined, we'll test them on two pilots, both of which are with real interviewers and members of the public. And what that gives us is data from the questions that we can use to test whether there are any particular issues. So for example, high levels of non-response or a code frame that doesn't seem adequate because we get lots of specify answers but also feedback from interviewers about whether any questions were difficult to read or too sensitive, and they're very good at suggesting um, improvements to wording as well. The third stage is that after we've refined the questions again, after the piloting, we'll have final questions, and we then need to look at the order that we ask them in, both in particular modules and between modules, and the flow overall. And we also have to think about the mode for the question. So as I mentioned, we've got a face-to-face -face interview and a self-completion booklet. And for new questions, we have to think about what's most appropriate. Um, we typically use the self-completion for batteries of questions that work well laid out on paper, and also perhaps sensitive questions or those that would have a socially desirable response. Sampling is happening around the same time as question design. Um, what we want from our sample is that it's representative of our target population and large enough to give us robust estimates. So for BSA, this is roughly 3,000 people. That's not huge compared to other surveys, but it does allow us to get a clear picture of public attitudes across the country. What we can't do is very detailed subgroup analysis or regional analysis. 
So we use random probability sampling, which is a statistical method, and it means that everyone in our sample frame has a known chance of being included in the sample. We use the postcode address file, which is a list of um, all private addresses in um, the UK. And we then do some multi-stage sampling, which means that first of all, we select postcode sectors, then addresses, and then in the field, the interviewer will, t will select a flat if necessary, and then the actual person that we need to take part in the survey. So the way that field work works is that the office sends out an advance letter to our respondents, and you can see there's just a, a picture of our materials on screen, so you can see that they're quite visually attractive. They also have a voucher, a 10 or 15 pound voucher, to thank people um, for their time. And the idea of this is to maximize our response rates and to help our interviewers, um, because they can refer to the letter and make it clear that we're not just cold calling also helps that respondents can make an informed decision because we've given them that information up front. The interviewer will then approach and select a respondent and probably make an appointment um, to do the interview at a later time. And then they'll carry out the interview in the person's own home and, select, and transmit the data back to the office securely um, and leave behind a self-completion booklet too. There will always be people in our sample that we don't manage to talk to. We get about a 50% response rate, which is fairly common for attitudinal surveys. And we weight the data at the analysis stage to correct for this. Um, but it's worth saying here about our four-month fieldwork period that this is because we make repeated attempts to secure interviews with the selected person. And that means that we don't just interview the most available or most willing or least busy people because they won't be representative of the public as a whole. So it's really important for our robust estimates that we make those repeated attempts and get the most out of our sample that we can. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Eleanor now, who's going to give you an example of how you can use the data. Hi there. So <clears throat> I'm going to take you through um, an analysis example. This will just illustrate some ways in which the BSA data can be used. Um, so this example uses some NatSend funded questions that are on personal relationships. And it's part of our 30th, um, it was done as part of our 30th annual BSA report. The focus um, was really on how um, attitudes have changed since 1983. Um, and this area in particular is somewhere where we've seen quite a lot of change over those um, three decades. So the two questions that we're interested in here um, are these ones on screen. Um, the first is about premarital sex and the second about same-sex relationships. For both, the respondent would be presented with a show card that listed five response options, always wrong, mostly wrong, sometimes wrong, rarely wrong, and not wrong at all. So in 1983, we found that 28% um, said it was always or mostly wrong to have sex before marriage. Um, that compares to just 11% in 2012. So if you see the chart here, you can see that there was a really steady decline from 1983 when about 3 in 10 um, thought premarital sex was wrong, um, steadily declining to 2012 where just over 1 in 10 um, thought premarital sex was wrong. Okay, we've got a poll now. Um, so in 2012, we're now thinking about same-sex relationships. In 2012, 28% of people said that same-sex relationships are wrong. What percentage do you think said this in 1983? So the poll is now open. You can vote for A, 42%, B, 52%, or C, 62%.
I'll just leave that a little longer to make sure you all, you've all had a chance to vote. Okay, great. So, um, great. So again, there's a real there's a split there between B and C, 52% and 62%, with just a few of you saying 42%. Um, so 2012 was 20%. In 1983, it was 62% of people who said it was always or mostly wrong. Um, so if we look at that in a chart here, so the top purple line shows um, the percentage of people saying um, that sex between adults of the same sex is wrong. Um, this, so this declined um, from a high of 74% in 1987 to 28% in 2012. So rather than seeing that steady decline that we saw with the premarital sex line below, um, there was an increase in the late 80s of people saying this was wrong, and that was really at the height of fears around the AIDS epidemic. Um, this was a really, a, this is a really big um, change over time, um, and shows a shift in public attitudes since the 1980s. And this is actually an area where, where we've seen one of the biggest changes over time. So we can use BSA data to explore whether these changes reflect a change in attitudes across society or if certain groups are driving that change. Um, and we did some analysis by religion, by political party, and also by age. So first of all, looking at religion um, and views on premarital sex, this chart shows the percentage of people saying premarital sex is wrong um, among um, various religious groups and over time from 1983 to 2012. So in general, we know that people are less likely to belong to a religion now than in 1983. So we might then hypothesize that views have shifted because fewer people are now religious. However, when we look at this chart and we compare the views of the religious groups across time, we see that views have changed within each religious group. So you can see, for example, that um, among Roman Catholics in 1983, 32% said premarital sex was wrong, and that's now declined to 11%. Um, so you can see some of the largest shifts have been among the religious groups, while those with no religion, they didn't actually have that far to go because um, only 11% um, said this in 1983. Um, we found a similar pattern when we looked at views on same-sex relationships by religion as well. So the fact that many religious people have changed and are now more liberal than they once were suggests that there are other forces that are more important here than just the decline in religion. Okay, so now looking at political party support, and this time we're looking at views on same-sex relationships. So this, there is still a difference in 2012 between the major parties. Um, with Conservative supporters being more likely to say that same-sex relationships are wrong. Lib Dems are most liberal in their views, um, and as well as those who don't have any affiliation. Um, but within each group, again, we see that change over time. Um, and when we looked at premarital sex, versus, there was very little difference um, nowadays between the groups. Okay, so now looking at, um, at these results by age, there's a slightly more complex pattern when we look at this by age, so I'll take you through the differences first to the 2012 only. This chart shows the proportions saying that these kinds of relationships are wrong by age. You can see that for both um, same-sex relationships and premarital sex, the oldest group is much less accepting of these kind of relationships than the younger groups. So, for example, um, nearly 20% um, in that oldest group three think premarital sex is wrong, and, and about half think same-sex relationships are wrong. Um, it's worth noting that for premarital sex, um, the middle-aged groups there appear to be um, more, more accepting of premarital sex than the youngest age groups. Um, when we did um, analysis of this, we actually found that there wasn't a significant difference between these groups overall. Um, looking at change in age groups 
um, over time, it's interesting to examine by age cohort rather than simply looking at age groups. So this is where we select a cohort and, and look at how their attitudes change over time. Um, this is not a real cohort because this is a cross-sectional survey, as Miranda's already mentioned. Um, so we're not following the same people, um, but we are able to follow the same age groups and see how their attitudes change over time. And this will really help us tease out different effects um, uh, in changes over time. So in this chart, um, we see general, generational change in attitudes to premarital sex over time. Um, so we have a line for each um, birth cohort, and we've divided um, by what decade they were born in. So for example, the top line is people who were born in the 1920s, second line is people born in the 1930s, and so on. Um, you can see that the top line doesn't extend all the way to 2012, and um, that's because we don't have the sample size in those later years. Um, and you can also see that the, the black line is people born in the 1980s. They've started joining in um, when, they're, when there's a big enough sample size of people who are old enough to take part in the survey. Um, so that's in the early noughties. So in general, you can see that the lines are stable across time. And that means that each cohort has not changed its view over time on premarital sex. The younger generations have more liberal attitudes and the older generations have less liberal attitudes and those attitudes do not tend to shift as people age. What this does mean is that um, as younger people grow older and replace the older generations, then attitudes across society as a whole will change and you'll see the patterns that we've seen um, in a decline in um, people thinking that premarital sex is wrong. So this chart um, is general, generational tech change in attitudes to same-sex relationships. Um, now here you can see there's a, there's a slightly different pattern. Um, so when we look at how cohorts have changed their views over time, all of the age groups have shifted. Um, there was an increase in people saying same-sex relationships are wrong in the late 80s, and then there has been a decline since then. Um, so if you look at each individual line, it does they do all follow that pattern. Um, so this shows a different pattern to when we were looking at the pre pre premarital sex. Although there are differences between the cohorts, older generations are less liberal than the younger generations, we also see um, a pattern of change over time within each cohort as well. Okay, so just to sum up on that, um, we've seen huge shifts in attitudes to same-sex relationships and attitudes to premarital sex since the 1980s, um, and we've seen changes in attitudes across lots of different groups in society. Um, there's little difference between groups and their attitudes now towards premarital sex, except noticeably for religion. There are still certain groups now that's uh, more likely to see um, same-sex relationships as wrong. Um, however, when we look at analysis by age, that's shown um, that different cohort trends, there are different cohort trends between these two questions, and that highlights the different patterns that could be hiding underneath changes over time. Um, so despite huge shifts, there is still a sizable minority who say homosexuality is wrong, 28%. However, um, from the patterns we've seen, we can see that it, it's very likely there'll be a further decrease in the proportion saying this. And just very quickly, um, here is a slide with a few um, bits of publicity that we got when we released those findings. Um, so um, we got picked up in the, across lots of different papers and um, radio and TV news as well. And that leads on nicely to talking about dissemination and analysis of the essay. So um, a good place to start to get an idea of what BSA analysis is out there is our BSA website. Um, and there's a screen grab of that on the screen now. This hosts all our online reports. Um, and we've been publishing our annual report here for the last few years. 
There's also some standalone um, reports on there as well. So when would it be appropriate to use BSA? Well, BSA is a fantastic resource to understand um, what the public thinks about particular issues, um, to explore differences between groups, so we do analysis by key de demographics, and also to examine trends over time in attitudes. Um, and you can do um, looking at trends over time by different groups, as I've just shown you in, in the analysis example there. However, there are certain circumstances where BSA is not appropriate. So um, one key example here is doing detailed geographic analysis. So if, you're, if you have a research question that's really trying to pin down into a certain area, um, I'm afraid BSA isn't the best vehicle for that um, because of our sample size and because um, of our, the clustered nature of our sample. Um, so there are other surveys, um, for example, something like Understanding Society is a huge survey. It's got lots and lots of res respondents. Um, so that might be a better resource for if you're really um, going to look at very detailed geographic analysis. Um, another um, example of where BSA is not so appropriate it's not appropriate at all, is when, um, if you're interested in understanding how individuals change um, their views over time, so that is longitudinal analysis, um, so if you're following individuals rather than looking at a cross-section over time. Again, understanding society or any other longitudinal survey um, would be a better resource. So, weighting and dealing with missing values. Um, if you're doing any analysis on BSA, you should always use the weight, which is called weight factor, WT factor. Um, it has the same name in every year, so on every day set it will be called that. And you just need to apply that before doing any analysis. Um, unlike many other surveys, we always include don't know and refusal responses in our analysis. These are valid responses to attitudinal questions. So if you're analysing attitudinal questions, then you need to include those. Um, most other surveys will set these, resp these responses to missing um, or negative value, but on BSA data sets you'll see that they um, are not treated as missing value, so they will be a positive value. Note that that doesn't apply to every single question across the survey. If you're looking at um, background variables such as age or sex, um, there you might want to um, exclude the missing values there. And there will also be genuine missing values um, on all questions. So, for example, if that question wasn't rooted to a particular group of people, they will have a, um, a missing value there. Okay, so just some practical issues um, for analysis here. Um, if you are doing time series analysis, you should note that there are separate data sets for each year of the BSA, um, and all variables will have the same name across those data sets where they are, have been asked in exactly the same way. If there's been a slight change in the wording, we will change the, um, the variable name. Um, repeat questions might not be repeated every year, it's likely that they'll be repeated every few years, um, and if you're looking at changes over time, um, a, a good tip is to focus on the overall trend um, rather than focusing on small year-to-year -year changes. You should look at them in the context of the overall um, pattern. Just on a more general level, and the questionnaire is split into three versions, versions A, B, and C. Um, each version has is asked to about 1,000 people, so 1,000 respondents. Most, a lot of questions are asked of the full sample. They're asked on all three versions, so that will mean that there are 3,000 roughly responses. But some questions are asked on one or two versions, so they'll only have 1,000 or 2,000 respondents. This might have implications for your analysis, so it's just worth looking into that, um, and you can have a look at the questionnaire documentation um, to get more details. Okay, um, I will now hand over to Sarah, who's going to talk about accessing the data. 
Okay then, so um, this is what the uh, UK Data Service website looks like. You can see it's www.ukdataservice.ac.uk. Okay, and um, we provide access to the BSA microdata amongst many other data sets. Now the quickest way to get to the BSA data is to go to the um, Get Data, which I'm clicking on now. And as it's moving a little slowly, there we go. I think it's a slow computer. Um, key data on the left-hand screen, on the left-hand side, sorry. And then you'll come to um, this screen here that shows you all the different kinds of data sets that we have available. We have a lot of UK surveys. These are the large-scale um, surveys often commissioned by the government, and there are many of those. We also, incidentally, have cross-national surveys, um, longitudinal studies, including cohort studies. We have international macro data, including um, data from the, I think, OECD, UN, and many others. UK census data, um, some business micro data, and also qualitative and mixed methods data, as well as some administrative data. Anyway, so um, sticking with the UK surveys, um, I'm going to scroll down slightly and then click on the British Social Attitude Survey. And this should take me through to the series page. So any um, survey that's, that's repeated with similar questions or with similar methodology has a series page. Not all surveys, of course, are repeated. But um, surveys like the BSA do are repeated and so have a series page. So here's the series page and there's a bit of information, a little bit of an overview in the series abstract. There's some, if you scroll down, getting started, just general information about how to get started with our data in general. Frequently asked questions which is specific to the BSA and some related resources um, and related case studies and some external links as well. Um, but the key thing is if we go back up to data access and click on the, uh, the data there, you can see here are all the different data sets that you can get, all the different BSA data sets. Okay, so I could just click on download order, which is to the, the right of the screen, but I'm not going to do that because I think it's more important to go via the uh, catalogue page, which has got all the information. You can also download the data from this page. So as you can see, it says catalogue at the top, um, the name of the survey, this time it's the 2013, and to the top right, you can just click on that download order button in order to download the data. Um, but before we do that, we'll have a look at the, uh, the title information, which tells you who has um, deposited the data, who, who actually did the, the work on the data and who sponsored it. If I go down a little further, the citation, so obviously when you, if you use this data, you'll need to, to cite it, and it should be pretty simple, you just basically copy and paste that, and that's the citation for this particular data set. And if we go down a little further, the abstract has the key information, so if you're new to a survey and you're not entirely sure whether it's for you or not, this is a really good place to go, because um, it gives you all the background information, um, often gives you the aims of the survey. It draws attention to other surveys that are related. In this case, um, the BSA is, um, has a module for the uh, International Social Survey Programme that I think, um, I think every year, I expect Eleanor and uh, Miranda will correct me if that's wrong. Um, and uh, so that means that you could, if you're interested in that particular module, look at um, analyses not just for Britain, but for other countries if they're included in this programme. Uh, towards the end of that, there's also main topics. This is something that's quite important. It gives you a little bit of overview of how the data are collected and also some of the key questions. Um, again, coverage, universal methodology. Um, this is good because it shows you exactly um, which countries, for example, were involved, which spatial units. Again, it, it's just an overview if you're not really sure that this, this data set might be for you. You're not entirely sure and want to check. Now, moving down, this is the key thing, really. Um, Documentation. So this has got all the information that you should need in order to be able to use the BSA properly. So this um, is the documentation that's provided to us um, by Natsen. Um, and I can just briefly show you, for example, I think, there we go, I've clicked on the questionnaire. And what you can see is it has all the information. It has a, a list of contents. 
And then if I scroll down, it has um, information about each of the, uh, the variables. And this is searchable if you use Control F and then search through, you can find information about particular variables. And if I go back, um, there's also, obviously you'll be interested in potentially all of these things, um, but the user guide, again, this is searchable. If I want to um, look at waiting using Control F, just search, and that should take me to all the places in the, uh, the guide that tells me about waiting, say if that's the thing I'm interested in. Okay, now... Um, to download the data, you should just click on this download order button. I'm not going to go through that. What you will see is that you'll be expected to log in to the UK Data Service. Um, in order to do that, you need to be registered with us, and anybody can register. Um, so it's a, it's a quick process. Um, it should only take you five to ten minutes to do that. And to download the data, you need to say what you're going to use the data for. It doesn't have to be a, um, a funded project or anything like that. You can use the data for, for any research purpose. And what we'd like is for you to just say what the, the use is so that, that NAPSEN and their funders are also aware of, of how the data is being used. And what will happen is that that will take you through various screens where you'll agree that you're not going to, for example, pass the data on to any other person. And when you get to the end, you'll be able to download it in SPSS data or probably tab delimited format. So that's the, um, those are the sort of stats packages that you're likely to want to be able to use this data in. Okay, another way of accessing the data is to access it online. So if you look near the download order button, just to the left of it, there's a button that says access online. And I'm just going to click on that. And this is an alternative way of really looking at the data. I wouldn't suggest you would use this for um, proper analysis of the BSA. It's uh, something that could be useful if you're planning to teach students about the BSA or if you just want to explore it a little bit yourself but don't want to actually download it. So if I click on the left-hand pane on variable description, um, I can see different clusters of variables here. If I click on the one that says newspaper readership and internet, so this is on the, uh, the left-hand pane near the top, if I click on that, you can see on the right-hand pane a list of the questions come up. And if I click on the first question in the left-hand pane, it says, do you normally read any daily morning newspaper at least three times a week? And that's question 221. And on the right-hand pane, you can see more information about that particular question. So it has the literal question. It shows the coding. So one is yes, two is no, eight is don't refuse, and nine is a refusal. And it shows the, um, the numbers of respondents who answered those queries and the percentages. Note that these are the unweighted percentages, however. OK, there's some summary statistics. So the number of valid non-missing cases, the number of missing cases, and the universe. So in other words, this question was asked to everybody. If we look at the next question, we can see um, a follow-on question. Which morning paper do you normally read, or which most frequently? And you can see the list of the, the, um, the papers. And um, you can see at the bottom it says minus one is not applicable. And those 2,064 people are the people who obviously don't read morning paper. So that's pretty straightforward. And you can see at the bottom the universe is now if yes at readpap, which was the question that we looked at just before. I'm not going to go any further with Nesta. There are other things that you can do with it. Um, obviously, you can look at all the variables I've just done in that way. You could, if you near the top next to description, there's something called tabulation. So I could fill this in, and you can create a, a crosstab that way. Um, but you do need to be already logged into the UK Data Service in order to do that. So I would suggest if you're going to do that, log in first and then go into Nestar. There are other things you can do with this. Once you've created um, your crosstab, you could show it in terms of um, a graph. Um, and you can see various things along the, the menu bar at the top um, there on, on the right-hand side. You can, once you've logged in, you can also weight the data. Um, you can subset it. And you can also, in fact, download the data. I wouldn't suggest this is a good way necessary to download all the data because it, it's probably just easier to do that from the, the main catalogue page. But 
one thing that it does allow you to do here is to download a subset of the data so you can download particular variables um, of interest you know and I, if you're going to do that then make sure you get all the variables you need including the weighting variables and any other administrative variables that you need okay so I'm going to stop there and I think we're going to move on to questions. Okay, so you can see on this slide the, um, the NATSEM contact, um, should you have any questions and you want to contact um, Eleanor Miranda or, or, or just more generally, is bsa at natsem.ac.uk. Oh, and I forgot to mention actually something important. Um, if I just go back to the UK Data Service website, sorry. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'm back on the UK Data Service website on the catalogue page, but you can do this from anywhere on the website. The top right-hand corner, um, if you click on Help, that takes you through to um, some various help pages, but in particular, if you click on Get in Touch, you'll go through to a web form, and this web form um, will allow you to send a query direct to us at the Data Service. Um, and we provide um, email help desks help basically to, um, to any of our users who have questions about the data. The kinds of questions that we're able to help with is if you're struggling with, say, registering with us or accessing the data, or if when you come to look at the data you, you're not entirely sure what you're looking at or you, you don't really understand the documentation. These are the sorts of queries that, that we're able to help with. If you have a more advanced query about analysis, um, then we're not really the right people to contact about that. If we have a query that um, suggests maybe that there might be some you know, problem with a particular variable or, or something more advanced than that, then we would contact um, NatSEN to, to ask them to help with that. Okay, so I think that's the end. Then I'd just like to, to thank uh, Miranda and Eleanor for their presentations, and I'd like to thank you all for coming. And I think I will end the webinar. As I say, uh, the recording and the slides should be available on our website um, in the next few days. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.